Welcome to lesson 2.1.2's review and preview. This is 2-16. It's the very first one. So I just went ahead and took the actual answer from the CPM book just because it's pretty specific and I don't need to create a new one for that. And there's really no explanation needed. So it says, explain the differences between an accurate sketch and a careful graph. A careful graph is to scale, done on graph paper, and its key points are clearly labeled. An accurate sketch clearly shows the shape of the graph, its orientation and key points. It may not be to scale or carefully drawn. So a lot of times I will want students to specifically plot things and at least three points so I can see what the gist of their graph is. But there are other times where I'm just like, hey, do a rough sketch of this. See what the direction looks like. So it gives you an idea. So if I said, what's the parent function for a quadratic? You could just draw it at the point of origin and do an upward parabola, and I wouldn't expect you to do any points. But if I was asking you specific information about it, then I would ask you to graph it more carefully. So that's kind of an idea of what I'm talking about. All right, let's move on. All right, on, on 2-17, they want you to um, use the P of X equation, X squared plus 5X minus 6. The first two steps, I'm just going to say, so part A we're going to go ahead and let me get a good color here. Okay, I'll use that. A, well, they want us to find the intersect uh, for the y-axis. So if it's the intercept of the y-axis, that means my zero goes on the x. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug in, and I'm going to say P of zero equals zero squared plus five times zero. And I know this is, you're like, wait, Indal, I could do that in my head. Yeah, you probably could. But if you have a teacher like I was, they're going to say, prove it. So this is proving it algebraically. So when I get done with all of that work, my P of zero equals six. So my Y intercept is zero, six. Okay. For part B, we're looking for the X intercepts. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to set the equation equal to zero because if it's an X intercept, then that means the y value has to be zero, okay? We're gonna go ahead and use my lovely diamond method, which I've talked about multiple times. And I'm gonna put my AC up here and my B here. Well, my A is one and my C is negative six. So I'm gonna put negative six up here. I'm gonna put five down here. So I have to come up with two numbers that multiply to a negative six, but add up to five. So it's going to be a negative one and six, I believe, and that works. Negative one times six is negative six. Negative one plus six is five. So I'm gonna break it up. X minus one and X plus six. And that means my X equals one because that would make those that set of parentheses equal zero. And my X equals negative six. So that is what you how you find the B intercept or the intercepts for the X intercepts for part B. Sorry about that. So let's use a different color for part C. I'm gonna go ahead and use this. All right, uh, we have Q of X now, and it equals X squared plus five X. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is find the Y intercepts. So um, let's just go ahead and put Q of zero, which means my Y intercept is at the point of origin because we have it equaling zero, zero, okay? Then let's figure out what the um, x-intercepts are. So that's the y-intercept. x-intercept, It's you don't have to use the diamond method on this one, but we do need to set the equation equal to zero. So it's gonna be x squared plus five x. What can I factor out of both? I can factor out an x and then have an x plus five. OK, that means that X will equal zero. Or X will equal negative five, and that's where that particular problem will cross at the X axis. So that takes care of C. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the graph. So let me get the graph. So let's take a look at this graph. You see that the blue is our X squared. Oh, isn't that funny? I actually have a color coordinated thing. So the blue equations, all of the work in blue goes with the blue graph. And then we've got some green going towards the red. Now you've got the, I've also plotted the um, 
minimum, the vertex for the blue equation. So you don't have to pay much attention to that. But right now, look at the x-intercepts and look at the y-intercepts. They're exactly what we calculated. The thing that's going to be interesting is if I come over here and I do part D, so let's do part D in a different color. On D, it's asking us to find P of X minus Q of X. So if I take the equation X squared plus 5X minus 6 and subtract X squared plus 5X, I'm running out of room here, then I'm going to go ahead and distribute that negative. So it's going to be x squared plus 5x minus 6 minus x squared minus 5x. So all of these, this cancels out, that cancels out, that cancels out, that cancels out. And all you have left is this negative 6. So your p of x minus q of x equals a negative 6. Well, that's kind of ironic because if you look, you have the first equation that starts up here with its minimum. And as you subtract those functions, it's the distance between the two. So it's the vertical translation down of six, so negative six. So that's kind of the purpose behind all of that. And hope that helps. Let's move on. Okay, for 2-18 or 2-18, however you want to say it, we have four problems that they would like us to solve for Z. Well, if you notice, z is in the exponent of each of these equations. And so this is part of exponential work, but part of getting ready for logarithms. There's kind of all kinds of things that you could be thinking about with this. But the simplest way to say this is for you to put it in common bases. So write it so they both have the same common base, because then you can cancel out the bases and then just solve for the exponent for z. So let's just start here. This is uh, this one is pretty easy to start with. We the base for both of them would be two. I could do two squared to the z. Okay. Then eight comes down to two to the third because two to the third equals eight, and two squared equals four. Now, when you do this, when we are raising a power to a power, we multiply. So this is now two to the two z equals two to the third. Well, now that we have the same base, I can cross out the bases and then just work from the the, the exponents that are left and solve. So Z in this case would equal three over two. All right, that's the answer for that one. The next one's a little trickier because it's got some more information in it, but still it's the same bases we're gonna go for. So I'm still gonna go two squared, put parentheses around it, to the two X over three. Then I'm gonna change it to two to the third, put parentheses around it, to the X plus two, okay? This would then be, again, you're going to multiply these and you're going to multiply these because when we multiply a uh, power to a power, then we have to multiply. So it becomes two to the four X over three, equals two to the three times X plus two. So my bases are the same. I can get rid of them. And now I can just solve my problem of four X over three equals three times X plus two. All right, well, I'm gonna multiply both sides by three. And that's because it gets rid of this denominator. So we will have four X equals nine times x plus two. Well, then we have to distribute. This is all basic algebra now, so that's why I'm going so fast. And then we have to subtract our nine x, so negative five x equals 18, and then x equals negative 18 over five when you divide by negative five, and that is part B. Okay, first off, I have a typo in this problem. It's not two to the z, it is three to the z equals 81. If I would have left that as two, um, that would have caused some addi additional issues. But if you look at the book, it's actually three to the Z. So let's just go ahead and figure that out. So I have three to the Z. And I know if I'm playing around on the calculator, three to the fourth equals 81 to the two. 
So this one, we now have three to the Z equals three to the eighth. Because again, we multiply when we raise a power to a power. So Z just equals eight. So that's part C. Part D, we have, you're, I think you're probably getting the hang of this, but five to the X plus one, oh, it's Z. I just keep forgetting that I'm so used to, it doesn't really matter, but this book likes to change up variables so that you understand that they can all be used. So let's just go ahead and work with it. All right, um, you'll notice I put X and B, but that's okay, we still solve for it. All right, and I don't think any teacher is gonna mark you wrong for that, at least I hope not. Okay, Z plus one over three equals five squared to the one half, okay? Well, let's write it again. Five to the Z plus one over three equals five to the one, okay? That's what two times one half is. So now we can cancel out our bases, which I probably needed to do there too. And we can say Z plus one over three equals one. Then we can multiply both sides times three to get rid of the denominator. So then we have Z plus one equals three, subtract one Z equals two. And that ends number 2-18. Hopefully that helped, but the, the goal here is to get common bases and then you can move on to the, um, the solving of the variable in the exponent, okay. Okay. So this one, 2-19 says, simplify each of the following expressions. Be sure that your answer has no negative or fractional exponents. So what I'm gonna do first, and even from the last number, you probably remember this, uh, 81 is the same as three to the fourth. So I'm gonna write it as one over 80, uh, sorry, not 81, one over three to the fourth to the negative one fourth. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but if I have an exponent in the denominator, I can move it up and it changes its sign. So I'm gonna move up the three to the fourth, but it's now gonna be three to the negative fourth, okay? To the negative one fourth. Well, three to the negative fourth, if I multiply these, remember we're raising a power to our power, so that's gonna equal a positive one. So it's gonna be three, oops, I wanna keep it green. 3 to the 1, which just equals 3. And that's the final answer for that one. This next one is a matter of just moving both x to the negative 2 and y to the negative 4 under into a denominator. Because just like I said before, where you could go up, if you're moving it up, it changes the sign. You can move it down, and it changes the sign. So that means this is now 1 over x squared y to the 4th. And that meets the instructions because even though there's a fraction in the answer, it's not a fractional exponent and it's not negative. So that's what you're doing there. Okay. On part C, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put 2x underneath. So I'm going to rewrite this first of all as 16x squared y, right, to the one half. I'll deal with that in a moment. But I am moving this 2x down here because of that negative exponent. So now it's 2x to the negative 2, or to the positive 2, sorry, 2, okay? Now, this means it's a square root, okay? So that means if it's 2 to the 1 half, I can also now rewrite this as the square root of 16x squared y, okay? And that's all over 4 x squared, because I am now distributing that exponent. But if I simplify that top, I can take, I've got two perfect squares in this answer. So I can take out the square root of 4, or 16, which is 4, and the square root of x squared, which is x, and then I have to leave the y in there, okay? And that's all over 4x squared. Okay. In this part, I can cancel my 4, and I can cancel this exponent because this will be, I can cancel that x because it'll be x, 4x over 4x squared. So if I wrote that out, 4x over 4 times x times x, I could cancel the 4s and the x, and all I'd have left is x in the bottom. 
So that's what I'm doing. And then I leave my final answer as the square root of X, I mean, the square root of Y over X. And that's the final answer. So this work here probably helps explain how I could cut, cancel some things out. All right, that is 2-19. Again, on, on all of these questions, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. I do monitor the comments and um, I will answer any questions you have questions about. Thank you so much. Moving on. Okay, this is a fun one for me because I like word problems and I, I get the sense that I can set up a system of equations for it. I hope I don't mess up these names, but I don't know how to pronounce them, so I'm going to do the best I can. I would say Daniela, Q, and Duyen, uh, sorry if I messed it up, decide to go to the movies one hot summer afternoon. The theater is having a summer special called Three Go Free. They will get free movie tickets if they each buy a large popcorn and a large soft drink. They take the deal and spend $22.50 on large popcorns and soft drinks. The next week, they go back again, only this time they pay each, each pay $8 for their ticket they each get a large soft drink, but they share one large bucket of popcorn. This return trip cost them a total of $37.50. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a couple variables. P is going to stand for number of popcorn purchased. Okay. And D is the number of drinks purchased. OK. So we know on the first week they didn't have to pay for any tickets, which we know are eight dollars each. But we do know that they each bought a large popcorn and a soft drink. So we can say three P plus three D equals twenty two fifty. OK. Now, the second week they went back. OK. And they each bought a large soft drink, but they shared one large popcorn. So. 3D plus P plus three theater tickets. And that equals 3750. So it's not in a position yet where I can actually solve it as a system. I have to get rid of my 24 that I'm gonna have here in a moment. So let's just take this, um, let's finish. This is one equation, just so you know. And then I'm gonna go ahead We're going to subtract 24 from 3750. So we have our second equation for the system. Okay. So there's equation number two. All right. So if I put these over each other, let's change colors. And I go 3P plus 3D equals 2250. Okay. And I put it over 3D. Wait. Let's line them up correctly. Let's line them up. That's way easier. P plus 3D equals 1350. Well, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do subtraction. Okay. I'm going to subtract everything. So 3P minus P is going to be 2P. These are going to cancel. And then 2P is going to equal $9. Okay. Now I can divide by 2. P is going to equal 450. So we'll talk about what that means in a moment. But now I can take that 450 and plug it back in, okay? So I'm gonna plug 450 into the second equation. Because I wanna find out what the drinks cost. So I'm gonna subtract 450. That's gonna give me $9. And then I'm gonna divide and that's gonna give me $3. So that means drinks are $3 each and popcorn is $4.50 a, a tub, okay? And that answers the question. They just wanted to know um, how things broke down. And that is the end of 2-20. Okay, on this particular problem, you'll see that I have already plotted the points and put the graphs in, and I've drawn right triangles. And that's because we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the length of these. There's also a distance formula out there, and I think I'm using it later in the assignment. But this one is important just for you to understand from 
the standpoint I'm at. So there's your part A. And so if I look at this, it is 11. Let me get, make sure I get a pin here. It's 11 here and it is five here. So what I would do is 11 squared plus five squared equals, and we'll just call this X, X squared. So 121 plus 25 equals X squared, okay? And that is 146 equals X squared. So that means X is the square root of 146, but that also rounds because you can't really simplify that farther. Um, nope, you can't. And so it would equal approximately 12.1. All right, so there's your simplest radical and your um, decimal form of that one. All right, that is part A. Part B. So on part B, I'm going to go ahead and look here. And I've got on this height, looks like nine, okay? And then on my base, it's eight, yes, okay? So it's nine squared plus eight squared equals, and we'll say X again, X squared. So we've got an 81 plus 64 equals X squared. And so that's going to be 125 or 145. And so then that also equals approximately pretty close to uh, 12, but we're going to round it so you can see it's not actually 12 because that would be the square root of 144. All right, part C. Okay, on part C, we have five and we have five and this is X. Now, I know that that means this is a special triangle because that means this would be um, 45 and 45, okay? So I'm gonna do the Pythagorean theorem, but this should equal five root two based on special triangle, okay? Let me write that. But let's prove it. So we've got five squared plus five squared equals our X squared. So that's 25 plus 25 equals X squared. So X is going to equal, I'm doing this quickly, sorry, 50, square root of 50. Well, if we break that down, that is the square root of 25 times two. 25 is a perfect square. So that means that we would have five, cross that out, root two as our final. And that's what we just proved um, by looking at it and considering it a special triangle. And that also answers D at the same time, because when you do C, you're gonna find all of that. But it is a special triangle. Whenever you have a right triangle with the same legs, then it's a 45, 45, 90, and you can go ahead and just a leg times root two is what your hypotenuse would equal. All right, that's it, moving on. So this particular problem is a word problem that can be solved pretty quickly just by graphing. It did say you could set up a table, but I graphed it on Desmos. And that's really all you need to do to find out the information that they're asking. The amount of profit in millions made by Scandal Math, a company that writes math problems based on tabloid articles, can be found by the equation P of N equals negative N squared plus 10N, where N is the number of textbooks sold, also in millions. Find the maximum profit of the number of textbooks that Scandal Math must sell to realize this maximum profit. So you'll see on my graph here, I have labeled my x-axis as number of textbooks sold in millions and my y-axis as profit revenue in millions. And what you're looking for is the maximum. And so the maximum based on this is at the point where the vertex is for this particular parabola. That means that they would have to sell 5 million books to reach a maximum profit of $25 million. That's why uh, quadratics are really interesting ways to solve things, like to find maximums and minimums, what's the best scenario. And so that pretty much explains it. Um, again, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comment section and I will get back to you. Hopefully this is like review for you. I don't know how much opportunity 
the person that's watching this, you have had with quadratics. So thank you so much. So for 2-2-3, I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and play this video for you. And then we'll finish up the rest of the question after this video, because I wanted to show you how things worked on Desmos. So here we go. Okay, on this problem, it's asking us, um, there's a, it says your friend is taking an algebra class at a different school where she's not allowed to use a graphing calculator. Explain to her how she can get a good sketch of the graph of the function y equals two times x plus three squared minus eight without using a graphing calculator and without having to create an xy table. Be sure to explain how to locate the vertex, whether the parabola should open up or down and how its shape is related to the shape of the graph y equals x squared. Well, first of all, if you look at the equation, I have it sitting up here. Um, this is the vertex form of a uh, parabola. And so in here, because I have x plus 3, that means my vertex is going to go 3 to the left because x minus h is the standard form, and so I'd be putting a negative 3 in there. So that's my x value for my vertex. And then I have negative 8 means I'm dropping down 8 for this particular equation. So I've already plugged in what my vertex is here, negative 3 and negative 8. Now, if I was looking at different points on here, I would probably plug in 0 first and see what happens. Well, if I plug in 0, that's going to give me 3 squared, which is 9. 2 times 9 is 18 minus 8. So that means I'm going to have another uh, point. My y-intercept is going to be at 10, 0. Okay, oops, let me put that in. Or not 10, 0, but 0, 10. So I'm going to go 0, comma, 10. Okay, so I know that's correct, all right? So, and that means if my axis of symmetry is my x value, I'm going to say x equals negative 3. Oops, i got to put 8 equals negative 3. So there's my axis of symmetry. Well, if I have a point here at 0, 10, that means I'm also going to go 3 away the other direction, and I'm going to have a point at negative 6, 10. So I'm going to plug in. I'm going to go here, and it's, it's not an xy table, but I'm going to go ahead and plug in another point down here, and it's going to be negative 6, 10. And then I should just be able to draw, okay, the graph. All right, right there. I could just go ahead and take a pen or pencil and just sketch. Now, I'm not perfect doing that. But I did type the equation up here, so let's see if we are correct. We are correct. It goes through both of those points that I, that I was talking about. Now, the other thing, things to point out here, this is our vertex. Our axis of symmetry is at x equals negative 3, which we drew. Our minimum is negative 8 because the y value is always the minimum. This opens up because we have a positive leading term. If this was negative, let's just show you what it would look like. It would be pointing down. All right, and that's not good. Oh, now I gotta go, it's going crazy here. All right, let's see here. Okay, so we're gonna put it back up to where it was. And hopefully I can get that graph back. Let's see, all right, there we go. Okay, and we'll move it down so you can see. All right, and that is pretty much all you needed to know about this particular problem for part A, okay? Okay, now the one thing I didn't talk about on this was um, how the shape is related to the shape of the graph of y equals x squared. So what I did, if you take a look at this graph here, this is our equation. Hang on just a moment, I gotta grab a pen. This is our equation, okay? That's what we graphed. Now, if it hadn't been translated three over and eight down, it would be this purple, where you see the vertical stretch. So, and the reason I say that is this is the parent function of y equals x squared. That is y equals x squared. That's your parent function. So you can see the purple, the shape of it um, compared to the parent function is it's skinnier. It's vertically stretched. It's almost like somebody's pulling a piece of taffy up. And then, but that green, this is the same equation without the translations in it. So it's when you say plus three in your parentheses up here, let's get a color you can see. It's when you see the plus three and the minus eight. That's the horizontal translation and that's the vertical translation. And the purple graph is just the, is just two X squared. So it's kind of comparing what's happening with um, the parent function. And then the original function that we were graphing without any translation of any kind. All right. That is it on that one.
Now let's look at part B. Your friend also needs to know the X and Y intercepts. Show her how to find them without having to draw an accurate graph or use a graphing calculator. Well, for the Y intercept, you just have to realize that X equals zero. So you just plug in a zero for everywhere there is an X. And this is one of the things we talked about in the video, how we found one of our points when we were just working through it. So this becomes two times three squared minus eight. Remember order of operations, it's going to equal two times nine. And that's 18 minus eight, which is 10. So our Y intercept is zero, 10. Now let me change colors here. Our X intercept is going to be, we're setting the equation equal to zero. So let's do that first. All right. And then we have two, times x plus three squared minus eight. Okay, I'm gonna add eight. And you're saying, why aren't you doing other things first? Well, I have reasons I like to figure out. Um, so I'm gonna divide by two, so it's gonna be four. And then I'm gonna multiply these out. Okay, so I'm gonna have x squared plus six x plus nine, okay? and that equals four, but now I have to subtract four, okay? I'm going to set that equal to zero, x squared plus six x plus five. This is where I'm gonna go over here because I have more room. I'm gonna do my diamond method that I've talked about, a times c. So in this case, a is one, c is five, so it has to multiply to five and add up to six. Well, that's five and one, all right? So that means it's gonna be x, plus five and X plus one, which means if you look over at the graph on our X axis, X equals negative five and an X equals negative one. And you'll see that right here. There's your negative five and there's your negative one, okay? And that's how you find them without using a graphing calculator. And that ends this question. Took a long time, but it's a good question. Okay, for 2-2-4, I'm gonna go ahead and show this video first. Then we're gonna talk about B and C. But let's do the video and that'll help you get ready for the next parts. All right, for 2-2-4, it says, consider the equations, y equals three times the quantity of x minus one squared minus five, and y equals 3x squared minus 6x minus 2. And first of all, A, we're going to verify that they are equivalent by creating a table or graph for each equation. I'm going to do a, a graph. So I've already graphed the first equation, y equals 3 times x minus 1 squared minus 5. So I'm going to plug in the other equation, which is y equals, and let's just bring this little thing up. It helps sometimes. 3x squared, and it's minus 6x, and it's minus 2. All right, notice that my line changed. I went from blue to green. That means they're coinciding. That means they are the same equation. Let me mute the blue, and you still see the green. Now, let me mute the green, and you still see the blue. That is showing that they are the same graph. Now we're gonna go back and we're gonna prove them algebraically. Okay, so algebraically, what I'm gonna do is manipulate the, um, the one that's in vertex form. And in case you didn't know yet, this is the vertex form, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and manipulate that. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to multiply out x minus one times x minus one minus five. So inside there, I'm going to have x squared minus two x plus one minus five. I'm going to distribute the three. And then I'm just going to combine the five and the three, the negative five and the three. So it becomes y equals three x squared minus six x minus two. 
And you'll notice that is exactly the same as the second one. Now, the part of C, it says, notice that the value for A is three in both forms of the equations, but that the numbers for B and C are different from the numbers for H and K. Why do you think the value for A would be the same in both forms of the equation? That is because on both forms of the equation, it is the leading term and it doesn't get mixed in with the other problems. So like this right here, we don't even attach that three to anything until we FOIL, or should I say multiply out the X minus one squared. And then based on order of operations, three is our leading term for both. And that's probably as good an answer as I can give you. Anyway, that is the end of 2-2-4. So for 2-2-5, I'm just going to go ahead and play this video that I created on Desmos with the help of the 2-2-5 homework e-tool. And so let's just get started. Okay, this is the 2-2-5 uh, problem for review and preview. And one of the things I like about um, CPM is that they have these great e-tools with Desmos and it helps cement concepts just by seeing the visuals because many people are visual learners, some are auditory learners, but me, when I see a picture of a graph and I can put some context to it, it's just way better. And that's what I love. And plus I also love technology. I taught computer science and AP computer science, so I'm kind of into tech anyway, so it makes it fun for me. So if you like e-tools, use them. It's They're perfect. All right, so this problem says, use what you learned in the parabola investigation to write an equation for each of the parabolas described below. So right now we're looking at A, a parabola opening upward, shifted eight units to the right and five units down. So this is part, this is part A over here. You can see in part B that they're going to have a stretch factor of 10 and a compression factor of 0.6. We don't have a stretch factor or a compression factor on this one, so we're just going to start it out as y equals, and then I'm going to put x in the parentheses. Now, normally it would be, if we did the standard form, it would be x minus h. Well, we don't know um, what h is yet. I mean, we know by looking at the description they had, but if you notice here, because it says subtraction, I'm putting in a positive number so it stays as subtraction. You have to think opposite direction when it comes to horizontal translations uh, for quadratics. Then we're gonna have to do, the only thing we have left, if you see this purple here, the only thing we have left now is to shift it down five. So the vertical translation are as is. So if it says five down, it's gonna be minus five. And that's where we are. So if you notice here, I'm gonna mute the equation here. So I muted it, it was red to begin with, and we know we got it right because when we put the equation in and we unmute it, it shows that it's coinciding with the other. Now, that's one of the reasons I like the e-tools because you know you got it right, okay? So then we're gonna go to B. This one's saying a vertical stretch factor of 10, vertex at negative six zero. Interesting thing here is it's much skinnier. So that means we're gonna have a 10 outside of our parentheses. So we're gonna say Y, equals, and because it's a vertical stretch, it's greater than, our a is greater than one, we're gonna say 10, and then it's gonna be x, and it says uh, vertex at negative six, so that means it has to be x plus six, and we're gonna square it. All right, and then it says the axis, it's at the axis, so we don't have a vertical translation. So you can always just say zero if it's making you feel better, but let's change the color of this. Actually, we don't need to change the color because it was green, so let's mute this equation. This is what we started out with with green, and when I unmute it, it's blue, shows you they're coinciding, so therefore they're the same equation, so we did it correctly. All right, we come down here, unlike the stretch, which was 10, we have a wider parabola here, and it says it has a vertical compression of 0.6, which is the same as 3 fifths. So we're gonna go ahead and start the equation with a fraction then outside. So it's y equals, and it's 3 fifths. You gotta remember to move over, there we go. And then we got our parentheses. And it has us at a vertex of negative seven, negative two, so that means it's gonna be x plus seven, not minus, plus. And we've got to square it. All right. Then it says our vertex is a negative two. That means it's shifted down two. So we've shifted over seven and down two. And that's where our vertex is. So I'm going to put minus two. Okay. Now I'm going to change the color of this one. Oh, 
It's also wrong, but that's because we're missing one key factor. So let me change this color so you can see it first. All right, I'm gonna change it to orange. Okay, see how the one we're graphing is orange and it needs to flip to go the other direction? That's one thing we need to do on this is put a negative in front of it. So we put a negative in front of it and it changes it. And then we know we have the correct answers. So that ends 2 dash two five and hope that helps you. Thanks. Okay, for 2 dash two six, it says the point three comma negative seven is on a line with a slope of two thirds. Find another point on the line. Well, first it'd be good to come up with an equation. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna solve using, let me get a pen here. We're gonna solve using the y equals mx plus b. All right, we're gonna solve for b because we know everything else. So our y value is negative seven. Our slope is two thirds and our x is three. And then we have b, which is our y-intercept. So negative seven and then three times two is six over three. So that's two and that's plus b. Then we're gonna subtract two. So our y-intercept is at zero, negative nine, okay? So now we know our equation is y equals two thirds x minus nine. So if we wanna find another point on the line, we can just substitute another point in. I think I'm gonna use the point six. I'm gonna start with x as a six. So let's see what y would equal if we did that. So y equals two thirds, let's plug six in. It's also a nice number because I can avoid fractions, minus nine. This will be six times two over three, so that's 12 over three minus nine. Y equals four minus nine, Y equals negative five. I know I'm going through this quick, but you guys know the algebra. So another point on that line, and there's so many different answers, but another point on that line would be six and negative five, okay? Let's prove it on the graph. So you'll see here on the graph, we have the black line is our Y equals two thirds X minus nine, which is what we came up with. Um, so you see it right, maybe a pen right here. Okay, that's the equation that we came up over here. And then this is the original point that they gave us that was on the line. And then we solved for another point, which is here. And you can see they are both on the line for this particular equation. So that ends two dash two six, moving on. Okay, when I simplify radicals, like this one says, simplify each expression without using a calculator. Remember that to simplify expressions with radicals, you can remove perfect square factors, such as in this example. I do that, I figure out what my perfect squares are. So let me just explain what that means. So if I have one times one, that equals one, that's a perfect square. Two times two equals four, which is a perfect square. Three times three, I think you see the pattern, it was nine, and then it would be 16, and then 25, 36, 49, and then let's go over here, 64, 81, 100. Okay, and what I do is I look at my number here, so I have the square root of 50, and I figure out what is the highest perfect square, and I mean highest, I don't start at one, I don't start here, I start at here, or even higher depending on the number, and I look to see which is going to be a factor of 50, meaning which one goes into 50 evenly. So I know it can't be 100 because that's double the value we have under there. So I also know it can't be 64 or 81 or 49 because 49 is only one away. And I know it's 36 because you can't double 36. It doesn't go into 50 evenly, but 25 does. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna rewrite 50 as 25 times two. Okay, now your example up here breaks it down in a different way. So I usually just take the five out and go, but we'll go ahead and do it the way they do it. So square root of 25 times the square root of two. And then, so this equals, square root of 25 equals five times root two. Okay, and that's how you simplify that. And you're gonna do the same thing. So let me see if I can get rid of all these little markings. Let's see. All right, it's kind of messy. All right, 
Oh, well, sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'm not going to redo it, but we'll, we're, again, I'm still starting from the top, not the bottom, but we have the square root of 72. So again, I start from 100 and I go backwards. Well, 181 and 64 are all not going to work. 49 is not going to work because 2 times 49 is 98. So 49 won't go into 72 equally, but 36 does. So it's the square root of 36 times 2. And if you want to write it as 36 times the square root of 2, then it would be 6 root 2. Okay. Often what I do also, so I can show you this is often the way I say it, not quite like their example, I would have the square root of 36 times 2, and I would know, okay, 36 is a perfect square. All right, so I'm going to cross it out and take the 6, and then what's left? 2. Okay, so the square root of 36 does come out, and it does go here, and then what's left is under the radical. Okay, the next one, let's go ahead and do that, square root of 45. This one takes a little longer so uh, because it does go down lower, but again, 16 is not going to go into 48, and none of the others, 25, 36, and everything up to 100 are not, but 9 does. It's 9 times 5, so square root of 9 times 5, so that takes the square root of 9 times the square root of 5, which is 3 root 5. If we did it the way I often teach it, it would be the square root of 9 times 5, well, I would take out the 3, cross out the 9, and then what's left is 5, okay? Just another way to look at it, and that is 2 dash 2, 7. So I like this part A. I'm going to be using what's called the law of sines, and if you remember that, it is sine A over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. Knowing, noticing that the little letters, uh, the lowercase letters are corresponding to the uppercase and the uppercase refer to the vertices in the angle. So the first thing I'm going to do is I need the triangle sum theorem. So I've got 50 and 20, that's 70. And 70 from 180 is 110. So I know, and that's because the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So I do know that that is 110 degrees. So then I'm going to set up the information I have that I know. So I know it's sine of 20 degrees opposite, over the sine, side that's opposite, and that is 17. And we want to know x, so the angle opposite that is 110, so sine of 110, okay? Now what I can do is cross multiplication here. So I'm going to go ahead and do x times sine 20 equals 17 times sine 110. I divide by sine 20, which lets me cancel this out. And I carefully enter this into the calculator. And it comes out to 46.71 approximately. And that is what x equals. 46.71, roughly, okay? All right, that's part A. So we'll use the law of sines also for part B. So the angle we have to find here is right in here, and that is going to be, so 55 plus 36 adds up to 91. 91 from 180 is 89 degrees. So we will be doing sine of 89 over 10, equals the sine of 55 over x. And again, we get to do this little cross multiplication. So it ends up being 10 sine 55 equals x times sine 89. I'm going to divide by sine 89. So x is going to equal 89. approximately, so let's do the curly bracket, which means approximate anyway, approximately 8.19, or if you're around to the nearest tenth, 8.2. And that ends 2-28.
moving on. Okay, for this last problem on this review and preview, if you look at part B, it says write an equation that represents your monthly food bill X years from now if both the rate of inflation and your eating habits stay the same. So there, this is just an exponential growth function. So I'm going to say exponential growth. And so let's talk about what all these things mean. This is the original amount. And so if I'm trying to build an equation based on this scenario, it would be F of X, and we're just going to fill these pieces in as we get them, uh, 300, that's your original amount, okay? Then you have R, which is the rate in decimal form. So we add, we've got one plus our rate of 4% is 0 0.04. Then in this instance, usually you have T on this, but they've got X. They've asked you to use X in this particular equation, but this means time in years. So our equation for this scenario, if we were talking about part A with five years, that would end up being 300 times 1.04 to the fifth. And that comes down to Okay, so that tells you in five years when you're living on your own, how much we use spending on food each month. If everything stays the same, $365. Now, this is the function that they want in part B. That is your function for this particular scenario. If it was exponential decay, you would see a minus. So if it was exponential decay, we would have it as A times one minus R to the T, okay? So hopefully that helps. This is part A and this is part B. And hopefully you followed along with all of that. And this ends review and preview for chapter 2.1.2. Again, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing because then you won't miss any of the videos that I put forward for the CPM curriculum. Uh, once I'm done with CPM, I'll work on other curriculums, but this is where I'm at right now. So, and again, if you have any questions, put them in the comment section of the video and I will get back to you and help you out. Thank you so much.